talk about customer discovery, uh, which the, the main goals of customer discovery are really to understand your customers or key stakeholders problems, both broadly and deeply to ensure that you're building the right innovation or the right solution to solve those problems. It's a process by which you're going to develop assumptions and hypotheses and then go out and ask questions to test those hypotheses and assumptions to allow you to validate whether or not you have product market fit. What you learn from that data is going to guide your product development, it's going to guide your business model development, and it's going to guide how you how you plan to enter the market and access those customers. Um, but really, it all starts with really broadly and deeply understanding the pain points and the problems that you're solving for those key stakeholders. So there are two different ways that you can go about customer discovery. Uh, the first is by crafting some assumptions and hypotheses, and then asking really targeted specific questions to try and get answers to those. This is known as inductive uh, customer discovery. On the other side of that is deductive customer discovery, where you ask really broad, open-ended questions to allow your customer or key stakeholders to uh, address issues that you didn't even know were an issue for them. So, you know, as you're going through this customer discovery process, you'll likely have a mix of both inductive and deductive customer discovery, you know, asking really targeted questions, but also asking really broad, open-ended questions, uh, which will hopefully allow you to gather nuggets uh, of information that, that you wouldn't otherwise have, have learned about. The process of customer discovery is aimed to help you identify product market fit. Many of you are developing really complex innovations in complex industries. Uh, so the, that timeline and path to market is several years uh, likely uh, to go through the product development and testing uh, any regulatory issues that, that you might need to face. Uh, so reaching product market fit of really you know, validated repeatable sales to a customer is, is a, lengthy, a lengthy timeline where you're spending a lot of time and resources to, to get to that point. So you wanna make sure that, that you have, you know, at least theoretical product market fit uh, before investing all of those time and resources. The process of customer discovery is an iterative one where you are asking questions of all of the different stakeholders in your, in your value chain and in your ecosystem to help you better understand all of the problems in that ecosystem and, and how you fit into it. So it's, it's a process by which you have a hypothesis, you ask some questions, you gather that data, you synthesize what you're hearing, and then you iterate. You either validate that hypothesis or you adapt it based on that new information that you learned. So customer discovery is very similar to the scientific method where you're, um, you have a hypothesis, you're gathering data to validate or invalidate that hypothesis and then moving forward from there. The phases of customer interviewing include identifying the people that you're gonna wanna talk to, booking the interview, conducting the interview, synthesizing what you hear, and then taking those next steps. Jumping into each of those phases, you're gonna start by identifying who are the stakeholders you want to talk to. And so while the process is called customer discovery, I'm using the term customer pretty loosely to, to encompass all of the various stakeholders in your value chain or in your ecosystem or your industry that you're gonna wanna talk to. So that could include your paying customer. You absolutely should be talking to your paying customer. But that could also include the end user who will be you know, using or benefiting from your innovation, stakeholders upstream in your value chain, so suppliers, manufacturers, uh, key strategic partners, um, industry thought leaders, as well as influencers who might not have decision-making power over your customer, but, but can influence that, that customer on whether or not they decide to purchase. An example of a startup that VentureWell has worked with over the years is Deliver Femcare, which is a startup led by Shante and Dia out of Georgia State University. And Shante uh, started this company based on a problem that she experienced herself. The startup is developing an absorbent menstrual cup for women who are not served um, adequately by menstrual products on the market today. And so she experienced this problem firsthand, wanted to develop an innovation to solve her own problem, but then realized for that to be you know, a commercially successful business, she needed to go out and do customer discovery to understand how broadly and deeply that problem impacted other individuals who, who menstruate. To date, you know, Shante and Dia have done more customer discovery interviews than almost any other startup who's participated in a VentureWell program. 
um, and, and they validated that there is a need and there is demand for their product. Um, so we encourage you to, to be like Shantae and Dia and, and go out and talk to those stakeholders to validate the, the problem as broadly and deeply as you can. How do you go about finding these stakeholders and customers to talk to? You're going to want to use whatever resources you have available. Um, so LinkedIn, obviously, is a great place to connect with individuals, to find individuals, and then connect with them. But you'll also want to go to where your customers or stakeholders are. So is there a conference or um, you know, an industry meeting that, that these stakeholders regularly gather at? If so, plan to attend that, whether you have a booth there or you just you know, circulate and mingle and network. Um, go to where your customers are. Another great place to, to find connections is if you're a current student, using the resources you have available on your university to connect with alumni. Um, or if you're an alumni yourself, you know, connecting with your alumni office uh, to, to get connections through, through your university uh, to other industry stakeholders. If you are a student, definitely use that, that connection to the best of your ability. You know, uh, customers are often really excited and willing to talk to, talk to students if it's approached from the perspective of a research project. As a student, you're there to learn and to understand. I think that's a, a key thing with all of these um, customer discovery interviews is really distinguishing the fact that it's not a sales call. You're not there selling to a customer. You're there in listening and learning mode to understand their problems and to understand the challenges that they face. You know, you're not there to sell them on your, your innovation or your product. Let's talk a little bit about crafting your hypotheses. So these, these assumptions are really critical to helping you navigate uh, deploying the scientific method and validating your, your business. Uh, so, you know, without a hypothesis, you don't have that North Star guiding uh, the direction that you're heading. So crafting a hypothesis in a uh, pass-fail manner allows you to employ the scientific method to develop your business the same way you're going about developing your innovation. VentureWell employs a hypothesis framework that uh, allows innovators to develop hypotheses, and it says a specific person or individual makes a decision or behavior that allows for a quantified metric. So let's talk through a quick example of what that might look like. A generic hypothesis might be battery manufacturers prioritize performance characteristics over costs. And that's a decent initial hypothesis. It shows the relationship between two variables. It shows the relationship between performance characteristics and costs. But it could be further refined with more specific knowledge. What particular performance characteristics? How much? What cost? Taking the next step, you have that initial hypothesis. The next step is going out and doing some customer discovery interviews to further refine that hypothesis into a more specific hypothesis. After customer discovery, that hypothesis could be refined to lead acid battery manufacturers prioritize charge acceptance over all other performance characteristics. And you can see through the initial customer discovery and how that hypothesis has been refined that the individual you know, the, the who, the customer, has gotten more refined. It's no longer battery manufacturers. It's now lead acid battery engineers. Who is the, the key stakeholder there that we're trying to better understand? That line has gotten more specific, as well as the performance characteristics. Um, you know, from, from this refined hypothesis, we can see that it's no longer just generically broad performance characteristics. It's now charge acceptance. That's the priority performance characteristic that we're interested in learning more about and testing. And then if we refined this hypothesis even further based on more customer discovery and more interviews, we would see that lead acid battery manufacturing engineers require a 50% charge acceptance in order to adopt a new technology. So this highly specific and really refined hypothesis provides a quantifiable metric that allows the innovator to say, okay, am I hitting that 50% charge acceptance mark? And if not, you know, if, if what you learn through customer discovery is that a customer absolutely requires 50% and your performance characteristics are at 40%, 
that informs your product development. You need to increase that charge acceptance. Versus maybe you actually haven't validated that 50% charge acceptance is what's required. Maybe that's a hypothesis you haven't fully validated yet. Um, and so you, you, know, you write it down and then through additional customer discovery, you hear from folks, actually, we only need 30% charge acceptance. You know, that additionally helps guide your product development and allows you to know what technical specifications you need to be hitting. So this process of, of customer discovery and continuously refining your hypotheses to be highly specific and quantified allows you to, to test and to have a pass-fail metric around whether or not you're getting the data to, to inform the, you know, the development of your innovation and the development of your business. Characteristics of a good hypothesis include it being pass-fail. Uh, you wanna be able to, to test and say, yes, I validated this, or no, I didn't validate it. Uh, you also want it to be clear and concise. You know, you're not writing a novel. You want this to be a relatively short statement that allows for that yes, no, pass, fail. You also want your hypothesis to be actionable. You want to avoid speculative phrases like uh, a customer likes or is interested in. You really want to drill into what is the specific action or behavior a customer is taking in order to, again, have it be pass, fail and, and easily validated. And again, customer discovery is not testing your product. You're not putting your innovation in front of a customer and saying, do you like this? In fact, your, your product should not come up at all. The point of these conversations really is to understand the problem that your customer or stakeholder has, both broadly and deeply, so that you are designing and developing your innovation and your product to meet those needs. But the point of these conversations is not to talk about your product itself. Once you have your hypotheses, you're gonna want to spend some time crafting the questions that you're gonna ask to answer and address those hypotheses. To start, you're going to want to avoid yes, no questions. You want to ask really broad, open-ended questions that allow your customer or your stakeholder to expound and provide detail around the question that you're asking. So yes, no questions, cut off uh, any you know, additional uh, information. So phrase your questions in a way that is broad and allows the customer to open up and, and talk more in depth. When you're first starting an interview, start with some easy questions. Don't jump immediately into, you know, what is the most challenging part of your day or what are the things that keep you up at night? You know, start start with some easy ones to, to get the conversation flowing and to have it feel more natural and organic. You're also gonna wanna spend time talking about your customer and their life. Like I said, you're gonna avoid talking about your product. And so you're going to be in listening mode, uh, asking questions to get them to open up, to talk about their, their life, their experience. You know, customers are, are experts in, uh, in their own right, you know, in the, the problems that they are facing and in the ways that they're currently trying to solve it. So tap into that expertise, uh, be in listening mode, and know that awkward silences and pauses are a-okay, that, you know, that is where you're going to likely gather some really important nuggets of information. Um, awkward silences, pauses are really uncomfortable for a lot of people, so if you can wait it out, uh, likely the person you're talking to will jump back in to fill that silence with additional information that you wouldn't have otherwise gotten. And that additional information can either provide data to help you validate one of your hypotheses, or it could provide data to point you in a direction you never would have thought to ask about. Plan to ask about specifics in the past rather than predicted future behaviors. Magic words that you could use could be, tell me about a time when you, or could you give me an example of a time when you. You know, those, those past examples are much better predictors of someone's future behavior than just simply asking about, would you buy this in the future? Or how much might you spend on something? So you know, asking about concrete examples from the past is a really good, reliable way to better understand future behavior than just asking open-ended speculative questions about what somebody might do in the future. Now that you've written your hypotheses and crafted your questions, you're gonna to wanna to get out of the building and schedule those interviews and start talking to people. 
So to do that, you're going to tap LinkedIn, you're going to send out a lot of emails, you're going to cold call people. Always use warm referrals, warm connections when you have them, but also don't be afraid of doing, you know, reaching out colds. Um, you never know who might say yes. Expect a low hit rate if you're doing cold calls. You're not gonna get a yes from everybody or probably even most people. But when you do get a yes, follow up immediately. When you wrap up an interview, ask who that person might connect you to as a warm introduction. So, you know, see serendipity. You never know who in your network that you know or who who in your network knows somebody that you want to know. See serendipity, take advantage of every connection that you make get out of the building, go to where those customers are, um, whether they're gathering at trade shows or conferences, you know, meet people in person, um, and then always ask for that, that follow-up referral uh, to keep the, the connections growing and to continue to meet new people. When you're scheduling the interview, you're gonna want to define the expectations for, for that individual. You know, are you wanting to meet face-to-face -face or on Zoom? Uh, how long do you want to talk to that person? What's the time commitment? Um, remember, you're going to want to make this as easy as possible for that individual to say yes to meeting with you. So keep the time commitment short at first, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Um, if you can go to them to meet them face to face, that's great. Um, if, you know, a Zoom call makes the most sense because they're on the other side of the country or in a different time zone, you know, uh, make, make it as easy as possible for that individual to say yes to you. And then see where the conversation takes you. You know, maybe that 15, 20 minutes of, of initial conversation is fantastic and that person is willing to talk to you even further. Take advantage of that. Follow up, say thank you, schedule some more time, um, but, but keep it on the terms of the customer. You know, you're gonna want to, to make it easy for them to say yes. When you're conducting the interview, you're not going to talk about your product. You'll definitely introduce yourself, provide a little bit of context on why you're having a conversation or why you want to have a conversation with them. But this is not the time for you to talk all about the innovation that you're developing. You're going to introduce yourself, provide that context, and then jump into the questions that put you into listening and learning mode. You're not, you're not selling as part of this uh, process. You know, you're there to, to learn, you're there to develop empathy, you're there to understand the problem both really broadly and really deeply so that based on what you're hearing in that interview, you can take it back and inform the product development. So after you finish that interview, you're gonna thank them for their time. You'll follow up with a thank you email, you know, a request for additional connections if it makes sense or additional conversations if it makes sense. Um, but always follow up and follow through with that thank you. During the interview, a couple of key tips, which I think I've already talked about, uh, but you're not selling. You're there to be in listening mode. You're, you're there to ask open-ended questions and to try and understand that problem really deeply. When you go into this interview, you're there to test a handful of really key hypotheses. You're not gonna be able to test all of the hypotheses you have across your business model. Any given customer, any given stakeholder that you're talking to, you're gonna to wanna to prioritize what are the top hypotheses you have for talking to that one specific individual. And so be really targeted in the conversations around asking questions that are going to help you get answers and to validate those initial hypotheses that you have for that specific customer or stakeholder. And then pause, right? Leave time uh, for, for additional information to, to come through. You never know when a customer is going to pipe back up with you know, additional information that's going to be the, the nugget of, of truth or the nugget of data that you need to, to validate or invalidate or to set you off on a new course or a new strategy that you wouldn't have otherwise known about. The deadly sins of interviewing. Avoid these things. Death by demo, death by PowerPoint. Uh, you're not going in there to sell. Don't take your product with you or a prototype with you. Don't take a slide deck with you to walk them through your pitch deck or the cool things that you're doing. Um, you know, leave, leave that at home, leave that for a, another conversation when you're at the point of being ready to sell. But also be open to your passion blindness. You are, are a really passionate individual developing an innovation to a really critical problem. And, and as such, you, know, you have to be really passionate about that problem and the solution that you're developing. Uh, but be open to the fact that not everybody is going to think it is as exciting or as perfect as you do. 
And those naysayers or those people who are, are not as, um, you know, as passionate can be just as valuable for you in gathering data and information that you need to help you ultimately be successful. So, you know, put down that, that bias, your confirmation bias, that passion blindness, and, and be open to hearing things that uh, might make you uncomfortable or might not be what you want to hear, but ultimately will help guide the product development and the business model development in a way that leads you to a successful path. After the interview, don't skip the review. This is the really critical piece where you're gonna synthesize everything that you heard as part of the interview. You know, if you're fortunate enough to have multiple team members be able to join an interview with you, do that. It's great to have you know, two team members at least on, on these calls where one person is conducting the interview, asking the questions, um, and another person is taking notes and you know, jotting down the, the learnings from it. Um, that allows the interviewer to be fully present in the conversation um, and still allows for all of that really rich data to be gathered on the back end. Um, so if, you know, if your situation allows, highly recommend, you know, having multiple people on the call um, and then taking the time after to debrief, you know, what were, what were the key learnings? What were the key statements that that customer made that help validate or invalidate your hypotheses? What new information do you still need to go out and gather from future interviews to help you validate or invalidate? Did you learn something that uh, is going to help you pivot to a new direction that you didn't know before? Um, so taking the time to really sit and reflect um, and synthesize what you heard is a really critical step in the customer discovery process. So please don't skip that. At VentureWell, after the interview, you know, we have a framework that allows you to map out you know, what was your original hypothesis, what did you learn, what are you going to do next, and then to help you get out and actually take action on that. So, you know, customer discovery, like I said at the top, is an iterative process where you're constantly uh, refining what you know or what you think you know with new information as you validate and invalidate those hypotheses. Um, you are likely uh, going to pivot over the course of this uh, process. And it's a process that's never done. You know, you're in the early stages now of trying to broadly and deeply understand the problem. Uh, but customer discovery is a process that's never done. Even once your product is on the market, you will constantly be communicating with your customers to understand what additional problems do they have. You know, is there an adjacent problem that maybe you could solve with a follow-up product? Um, so even, you know, even once you're at the point of commercial launch and sales, you'll still be going through this process of trying to understand your customers and their problems in ways that you can meet it. So using, you know, using this framework uh, to, to develop hypotheses and assumptions and to go out and test it and to pivot and iterate um, is an invaluable process that will guide the development of your business moving forward. In order to put this into practice, we have a bit of an exercise for you to do. Spend some time aligning with your team members on what your top three or four hypotheses are across your business model, your value chain, your ecosystem map. Um, you know, write those hypotheses down in using the framework that we provided and uh, then spend some time writing out what are the, the top three or four questions that you might ask a customer to help validate those three or four hypotheses that you've generated. And then get out of the building and go start asking those questions to start to validate or invalidate those, those hypotheses.